Uh, welcome to New York University Tisch Dance. I'm Sean Curran. Uh, I'm the chair of the dance department here. I'm also a member of the class of 1983 when I had the great good fortune to meet Mr. Bill T. Jones, who of course needs no introduction. Uh, last year we talked about all sorts of political things, but as Bill taught me, no, but I, I claim that. <laughs> Um, we, last year we talked about all sorts of political things, but uh, I learned many lessons from Bill. Uh, and one thing is that all of your work is political, even your omissions are political, mm -hmm. as I think he used to say. <laughs> um, so um, we're going to talk about uh, this new work, a trilogy, analogy trilogy, that is made up of three big dances, each one about an hour long. Um, and the jumping off place was a novel. Yeah. The other two uh, involved in intense research that, that, that were oral histories of real life living people to inform, to inspire, to, to um, suggest what the making and the doing of this, this work would be. So um, a lot of you will be going this weekend. Uh, I can't wait. I've seen two of the sections live. I've seen the newest one. Um, Ambrose only on recording, but to see all three together is, is going to be a, a pretty an incredible treat. Bill, will you sure. tell us a little bit about this process? Right. Um, jumping off place, and here we are three years mm -hmm. later. Uh, so I don't know where to start. You know, I don't know if you all have this problem, but it's not, maybe it's not a problem. Uh, I was listening today talking about the great uh, philologist uh, Hannah Arendt. And one thing that Hannah Arendt learned from uh, Heidegger, and if these names are of interesting, interest to you, you should look them up, she's very important, was something about, um, what did he say, the, the, the conversation, oh, thinking is acknowledging the conversation we have with ourselves. Now, I, I thought, thinking or obsessing? Obsessing, no. But uh, Hannah Arendt was a big one that we, what distinguishes us as human beings, what makes us not banal. You've heard the term banality of evil? Banality of evil was a reference to Eichmann, the great architect of the Holocaust, and the fact that he was, quote, just a functionary. And she said the man was banal because he did not think. He didn't know how to think. Now, we can debate if that was a pose or not. But I, what I'm getting at is I think all the time, and I'm always, I hear you mention something I said years ago, and I'm thinking, well, is that bullshit? I mean, blah, blah, blah. And I, so much so that I didn't hear the rest of what you were saying, I began to critique and go back and forth. Reading Seabald, and I, for though any of you who have a literary bent, um, W.G. Zebald, S-E-B-A-L-D, I believe is really worth your time, and a book, one book, which is actually four books, the Immigrants, E-M-I-G-R-A-N-T. Um, it has one story called Ambrose Edelbart. They're all intriguing. You, what you learn about these people in a casual way is usually um, turned in such a way that there's a wallop that comes to you. Oh, that's what that meant. Now, you know, I'm beginning to understand it. that's what life is like as well. Let's get back to that. Let's not forget the conversation about Dora, 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 mm -hmm. Dora, okay? I was reading this book at a time when I was beginning to, once again, thinking the modern dance world, oh God, so much wanking, you know? Oh, excuse me, excuse me, you know? <laughs> That's called masturbation, dear. Right? Oh, it's masturbatory. Um, and modern art, um, do I care about your form? Do I care about this and that. Then, but when reading his book, his book had this, something it felt like you were reading a first rate uh, travel log. It felt like you were reading a man who had, uh, who understood Freud. It felt like you were reading a modern German man who was still involved in a great project of the latter part of the 20th century, uh, trying to understand what the hell did my parents do? And how, can, how do I deserve to even be allowed to be in this world? So the book, like many of his books, is talking about the history of destruction and so on. All great, all literary. We had these kind of, we still have them, don't we? Every 18 months or so, we have 
a sit down with Bill, you know, one on one, because there's no contracts. And I always hold my, I, I pretend it doesn't matter, but I'm scared because I'm going to say, well, you know, I've decided that I've got to move on. Because, you know, I fall in love with these guys. There's one of them there, you know? And uh, it was one of the most beautiful dancers I'd ever had. And the time came that he had to go do something else. And that, that's difficult. It's very difficult. And when it, anyways, one of our dancers, Eling Leon, L-E-U-N-G, excuse my pronunciation, Chinese pronunciation, when they get to ask me questions. And this is the, around the time that I had probably just won a, uh, my second Tony, the first Tony was for uh, uh, Spring Awakening. Spring Awakening. The, the, the next one was for Fela. Should have won for Best Musical, but it won Best Choreography. <laughs> Consolation Prize. <laughs> uh, anyways, but we don't go there. We don't look back, right, Jamal? We look forward, right? Anyways, and I was feeling in, that I was like this guy who's been tipping out and has two families. And there used to be a time when Modern dance was it. That was the shit. But then suddenly, you've now been giving a lot of time to commercial theater. It's very, in, it's much more impersonal. It demands a lot from you. It offers the chance of making money. But, and so Elaine nailed me. She said, well, you know, what I want to know, what we want to know, this is before any of you, right? So I can speak. She said, where's your interest? Oh, my interest. Then I had to come clean. Quite frankly, my interest was not in uh, how the organization of the body is, uh, you know, style, the postmodern style, release technique. Uh, what is the relationship of uh, classical ballet to the um, dropped pelvis and those sort of things? I wasn't, um, I said it was more about something about words on a page. Why did I just go completely into this world? It's just me and a book. And I, sometimes I wouldn't be breathing. I'd say, what just, what's going on here? So first of all, the literary, the, the, the allure for a mid-career um, former dancer, choreographer, struggling with the slings and arrows of outrageous art funding, critical appraisal, <laughs> all that stuff. Or you could go into this world and see ball just got me right there, and there was something exciting about it, his research, uh, his, um, his kind of wry humor, and the fact that he could write about something and it felt like someone was really, he was writing about a real thing. And this, we'll get back to this question about the oral histories and is it cheating or not? Um, the, and, and I told Eileen, I said, it's literary, but I didn't want to let my family go. And this is the family, the, the company that bears the name of Arnie Zane and Bill T. Jones. And as you probably have heard me say, this was the child that we had. And I don't know if any of you um, are, come from a situation wherein you very much, either you are the thing that survived the divorce, or you are the thing that survived the parent dying, or are you the survivor of a relationship, and what you have is that child you look at every day and again you look like its father or its mother and sometimes that's good and sometimes it's bad but I was thinking no this company no no I'm gonna I'm gonna try it again as my mother would say oh one more time oh one more time oh Lord I'm glad to be in the number one more time well unless I think she's sentimental that's always with me try it again and uh, we had just done a piece called Storytime, and I was thinking, well, how can I take this love for the literature and this story in particular, that number, the third story called Ambrose Edelbach, and how can I introduce it to these, it seems like, ever more young people. The people, were, when we started out uh, dancing, Arnie and I, people were um, our same age. And then, a few years go by, and okay, they're maybe a little younger, and then it goes by, oh, they're your grandchildren. And then you stop counting. Um, but you have to love them. They don't understand my references. They don't understand what Arnie and I were working against when we started. They think they just invented um, hurt and pain and, and all of those things. No, 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 we did that first. And that's one of the first lessons that middle age teaches you. It's always first for somebody. 
respect that. It's always there first. So we're going to put together a piece around Ambrose. And um, I had some years earlier been, um, this is the long play version of it, please uh -huh. remember this, right? Uh, some years earlier, uh, my companion, my husband, uh, Bjorn, his mother was visiting us. Her name is Dora Amalon, French Jewish woman who was 19 when the uh, Nazis marched into Antwerp and her mother had cancer. Literally, her mother was in a coma. So they couldn't leave, everyone was leaving the city. Now this is a story that she happened to mention. She's a French woman and she loves after, so Bjorn is the, he runs the house. He's cooking and I'm the captive audience and she is a raconteur. She tells a story, she pulls that glass of wine and well, as I was saying, in 19, you know, like this, you know, and it's mesmerizing, you know, it's, it's bedtime, and she's going on to another story. Uh, I thought I would give a gift to Bjorn and uh, his brother Ronnie, only two of them, and that would be their mother's story, some of which I think Bjorn said they'd never heard growing up. And I don't know if any of you are, are Jewish, uh, you know the Holocaust, but the many people who have survived uh, the Holocaust don't really tell their kids. They might tell their grandkids, but they don't tell their kids what happened. And here she was telling me all these stories, so I was going to organize it. Tell me the four years of the war, Dora. Talk about postmodern nonlinearity. You can't, you can't do four years. And um, I had this uh, about, um, oh God, I don't know how many hours uh, of, of several hours of, of her talking and telling these fabulous stories, suddenly the lights went off and I realized, oh, Siebel talking about almost the same period, European, uh, he's German, of course, uh, referencing very strongly Jewish experience. And then I have literally these tapes of a person who I love and I sit across the table from, wow, well, why don't you see if you put them together? And the first version, of Janet Wong, my miraculous uh, co-artistic director, we um, were working on, we, we went through, Bjorn transcribed, and we went through, we tried to find the story in them, and then we were going to combine Dora's story with Zeeval's story, and the first results were, it didn't work. It was too much. So we put aside Zeeval, and we're going to focus on life, which is Dora. And that's where the first one started. I, um, we had, it, it felt like a good beginning. Uh, there's something about one day, one set, very few objects, I hate to say props, and the idea of construction, which is my, what I love about saying I am a postmodern choreographer. We were taught, um, we weren't taught, maybe they should have told us what's your message. You know, what's this about? And Martha Graham, you're asking what this, oh, this is going to be about incest. This is going to be about the woman's struggle to uh, understand herself. This is going to be about the ancient Greek notion of revenge. Well, what we were taught was, what can you make? We'll make something. I don't know what you choreographers in the room, are, you're probably all different, but maybe you are now in a period where you do go in, I am going to write the great American novel and dance, right? Uh, but we didn't. And Arnie and I were very much visual. Arnie was a visual artist, a very good visual artist. And it was all about construction, what our bodies constructed, uh, time, very much this is the era of minimalism, uh, repetition, all those things. But Bill T, and here I start thinking, speaking the third person, I don't know when that happens, um, but it does happen. Uh, but Bill T always told stories. I said it was the African-American part. My mother and father, the way I know about my history is the stories they told. So it was natural to me, but now we have this problem. How can we do what we do in the postmodern way, organizing people and objects? Um, you probably have heard me say, people ask me, what is dance? Dance is the movement of people and things in space and time. Yeah, that's pretty broad, isn't it? Considering what we know about the quantum level and so on and the large objects in the universe. But what is choreography? Choreography is the identification, generation, and organizing of choreographic, of dance materials. Ah, there's the human thing. So we are makers, but we're also going to 
um, try to find a way that if we can I say content sits over here, form is here. You don't dare look at content because then it becomes sentimental and it collapses. You have to be aware of it while you work out your form. It's very really clever, I think it's clever. I want you to know I've never said it that way before. And most of what you hear tonight I have said many times, so I'll, I'll come clean. That was pretty original. This is form. Content is in your peripheral vision. If the work is good, it will leach into the content. And the content will sometimes jog and amplify content. Uh, I'm sorry, formal jog and amplify content. So we made the first works. We decided it was all going to be about Dora. Nick Hallett came in. I thought, God damn it, I want, I want a black sound. So, but I love Schubert. What's a girl to do, right? So, uh, Let's see, so, okay, let's find a choreographer, I mean a composer, who has a feeling to shoot it and has the chops. You, know, you don't mess around with this. It feels like it's hard on the sleeve, but it's really built intelligently. You've got to understand something about the rules of, uh, of music making. Schubert. But at the same time, how do I get the, the heart, the feeling, which is when I hear my mother sing, my own voice when I'm, uh, when I'm burdened down, what do I go to slave songs? I go, so I wanted to, I thought it had to be, um, I thought it had to be a black person who was going to go into this with me. Well, with the Pauline Kim, who's a wonderful uh, advisor to our company, she came up with guys, uh, they were all guys. Uh, no, 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 there was one Asian man who was a jazz player, wasn't right. Uh, but they weren't, um, it wasn't working. Uh, the singers were either too uh, classical or they really were, if they were black singers, they couldn't handle the Schubert. So, but Nick had the kind of craziness, he's a former club kid from the early 90s, very serious about classical music, and he's interested in new opera. So, Nick would um, be my composer, Nick Hallett, and he would help us find the black voice. So that's what we're working with Matthew Gamble, who is a um, baritone. So we're beginning to build the team, and that's Dora. What was, um, Dora was 19 years old when uh, the Germans walked in, and I thought many of my dancers were not much older than that. And I was, in some ways, um, messing with the youth and saying, look, imagine this is you at age 19, and you are running through the streets of Antwerp, and bombs are dropping, and your mother is, uh, needs laudanum uh, because she's in such pain from the cancer. And Dora said, you know, at that time I realized there's two kinds of people, those who need help and those who give help, and I want to be in the second group. And I said, if nothing else, my young modern dancers, who, let's, let's face it, I don't know if, well, in this room there might be people who are refugees, and, you might have stories to make my head stand on end about the way you stepped up to life's challenges, perhaps. Are you making modern dance? Good for you. Um, I'm being sarcastic. This is how my feelings about modern dance have changed. I often thought it was so irrelevant to the real world. Anyways, we, have now have, we, we now have a team, we have a piece about a person. I'm showing it at New York Live Arts and a former board member. Uh, can you believe this? After it was over, we do question and answer. Be careful who you invite to comment on your work in progress. So what do you think? <laughs> well, people are saying, oh, it's so touching, da, 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 da. It's too Jewish. Too Jewish. You're a black gay man, and you're going to have to explain to the dance world why you're making this piece about a Jewish woman. Are you kidding me? I have to explain anything? You know who I am? This is fighting words. Hey, excuse me, fuck you. But you don't say fuck you, because maybe they might support the company again, so you don't, you're not allowed to. You know, you know, I know, we're friends, we've been talking here, right? You know, you're always balancing that thing, you know, that thing. So, and I said, you know, I don't have to explain anything, and da 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 But you know, something was eating at me about that. 
And what happened was my nephew, Lance Theodore Briggs, who I remember when he was in my sister's belly, the only boy she had, who turns out to be gay. Uh, I was there at the San Francisco School of Ballet when he was eight years old on a Saturday morning when he wanted to be like Uncle Bill. Uncle Bill and Michael Jackson. That was his <laughs> idea. <laughs> okay. Can you imagine? Uncle Bill and Michael Jackson. You know? Sweet. A little, a little frightening considering that he really know it on his own. You know? Anyway, so he gets accepted. I'm very happy. I'm talking to him a couple of, maybe a year or two later, and I say, are you still taking ballet? No, I stopped. Why? They're racist. <laughs> but where'd you learn that word, right? But he lives in San Francisco, and I know <coughs> how things roll in San Francisco. But he said they were racist. And he never explained to me. And, and he said, and plus, I'm, start, I'm tired of doing exercise. I want to do some real dancing already. So. I'm sure you've had this discussion about which forms the hierarchy of forms are. Now, this is very important. Uncle Bill says to him, what? You've got to learn hierarchy before you can get down and do whatever thing you want. I didn't say that. So um, that's what he told me. They didn't. They were racist. He was sick of doing exercise. He wouldn't do real dancing. And it was only about the time that Dora was getting completed, and I was talking with him regularly. He just got out of prison. You know the drill, right? How many at-risk kids in this room? I don't see one. Great set of eyes there. You made it though. You know? You know that term, at-risk kids? Yeah. Yeah. And if you get in a sense of school of ballet, you should be saved, right? You know, if you, you know, all those good liberals are going to take care of you and you won't get pulled into the quagmire. Well, it just so happened that he turns out, and then he tells me only when he's out of prison after having lived a scandalous life, beautiful man, model, uh, he could dance like Michael Jackson, he had done a tour around the world, but he was also a drug addict and a sex worker. I'm finding all of this out then because he, now he wants to tell the truth, Uncle Bill. I don't want to, I don't want to lie anymore, I want to tell the truth. Truth telling is very expensive. Particularly when you're talking to somebody that you idolize and you want him to see, this is him speaking to his Uncle Bill. I thought, he, I learned only later that he was telling a lot of what he wanted me, he thought I wanted him to say. Which is really kind of cruel, isn't it? You can trust me, tell me the truth. Well, long and short it was it, when he was eight, he was hanging out with some young guys in his neighborhood and Somebody had buds. And he said, where'd you get the buds? Well, there's this guy over in Castro. If you go over to his house, you know, he'll, he'll, you know, he'll get a bud, get free buds. Now, this I don't understand, considering my nephew, his father was already growing pot in the backyard, but that's another question. <laughs> Not only in this house, there were two other boys, um, mysteriously there, that he was keeping in the living room, this man, who had another man. Uh, just like what it sounds, it's a pederast. Now, you, it's volatile, isn't it? Here you are, 10, 11 years old, little black boy, two white men. I don't know race has, uh, race has its dimension, and those of you who see the show, you'll understand um, when you're in a situation like that, what the black boy is expected to do, and what turns on uh, men who like little boys, if you miss a, the black one. But, Use your imagination. Because I felt, holy shit, this is where my nephew, who, when he was, around that time he was accepted, we were riding through Castro on a bus one day, and he said, Uncle Bill, Uncle Bill, he goes, see, these, these are gays. I said, oh, really? Yeah. I said, how do you know they're gay? Because they have beards. <laughs> they have beards. I said, I don't have a beard. What? I said, I'm gay. Oh, oh really? Oh, I, I just want to be just like you. I gotta think about that now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you're able to laugh, you know, because if, if you think about around the time that innocence was encountering two men who happened to be white men in the Castro neighborhood, who were giving him cocaine and he's doing ever more extravagant things, and before you know it, 
He's a hustler in the streets on Polk Street, and a whole bunch of things happen. Well, this all is, all of this stuff is an oral history that I was doing with him. Because we're going to talk every week. You say you love me, you're going to be straight business. And are you a special case? No, I'm not a special case. Don't treat me like, I said, okay. If you're not a special case, then when you give me your word, you're going to stick by it. And one thing is, you want your Uncle Bill in your life? Well, then you have got to call me once a week, and we're going to talk. Which is no big deal for you, I'm so sure I can tell you at NYU, right? Uh, well, but he had, I don't know if he'd ever done anything consistently like that, but he was doing it. And I was recording it, and I was making a piece called Dora. And I'm the artist, the kind of manipulative artist looking for his next piece with hearing everything he said with the idea that it could become text. What do you remember? What the audition was like? What is spotting? What is a triplet? All of those things. And I was seeing my dancers already, um, as they're all, many of them are conservatory trained. At least one of them came from this there. He wasn't in company yet. but. Uh, this place has been a repository for many dancers. And I had this kind of cynical thing. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, in that, in that ballet room was a little black boy who should have been going to the stars and fame and all that. And what was he doing? He was getting chewed up in another world called a shadow life. So, and he's a songwriter. And he was working on a show called Welcome to the Pretty Show, The Ugly Truth. He told me in prison he had done that. Great title, right? Welcome to the Pretty Show. Who's pretty? Well, pretty is this, I don't think pretty is transgender. Because quite frankly, my nephew didn't really understand the difference between uh, being a drag queen and transgender. And he didn't really have a lot of respect for transgender people, when, even if you some years later. Oh yeah, there's all these guys who want to cut off their dicks. Well, wait a minute, where did you get this idea? Well, he hadn't thought much about it. I know all about gay people, you know? So anyways, the ugly truth. He was going to tell the truth, everything. And I said, okay, I'll help you. We're going to record everything you say. Let's start at the beginning. Where does your name come from? So that's how Lance came about. Lance uh, was a rough one to make because it was so, oh, you gotta realize when you come to see that brilliant solo from uh, Christina um, called This Is My Life, because I was trying to get him to contribute his music to it. You're a songwriter? Well, let me borrow your music. Now, they're all just tunes. Nick Hallett has the, the chops to actually put chordal structures, organize them and all. So we were, we were using, just as we used Schubert and Dora's songs from her childhood, Parle Marle, Parle Marle, L'Amour, those sort of things where um, we could also use uh, uh, tribalistic. Um, uh, this is, uh, thank you for sharing my pain, uh, these songs. We could all choose them. I want it more, 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 more. And he's getting more and more ill. He's in the hospital. He's left New York, he's with his mother. And he's going to have an operation, and the doctors have said that he has a 50 to 50 cent percent chance of living. 50 50. One operation, he could die on an operating table. That's, now, you don't want to panic him, but look, Arnie Zane died in my arms in our bedroom, the same bedroom I sleep in now. Do I need to rat you? Maybe you're all way too young, but you know what this town is like. 20 years ago, people dying every day, and, and so on and so forth. And I knew that some of those people were able to work. Arnie Zane lay in his bed and made choreography with one of his dancers coming up, and he's shouting instructions from his bed to work, to make her work. This is normal. And if you're a badass artist, and I'm, I only associate with badass artists, <laughs> fearless, generous, resourceful, loving the God of creativity. My nephew says he's an artist. Well, where's your shovel? Write a song about, oh, I can't write, no. 
Write a song about where you are right now, the hospital. What's it like when the nurses come in? How does the light change over, the, over hours? What, you know, write a song. And he gave me something on the eve of this operation. I give it to Nick Hallett. Nick Hallett goes, put some chords to it, and you hear Lance singing this song in a tremulous voice. And, um, and I remember the conversation saying, well, we've got to get it to him right now. Because I like this to be the last thing he listens to before he goes under the anesthesia. This is how real it was, ladies and gentlemen. This is while making modern dance, right? He didn't die. We continue our conversations. Has he written a show yet? Every week. Uncle, you just see this charming gentleman right here? I hope, don't answer that. Uh, I am on his ass every week. But where is this piece? Where is this show? You know, no excuses. Even sick and dying is no excuse. Because you want all those people, and let's face it, he comes from a black fundamentalist family. They have poor homosexuality. He's been told to his face that he is an abomination by people literally he's living with. I said, man, you know, I know what you're saying. I, you gotta, you got to, you gotta rise up. You, you see your little nephews, many of them are probably your age, who uh, snicker about him behind his back. He's a sick and dying faggot uncle upstairs. You know, if, you're, if your life has been set up in such a way that you're in that house, a lot of us get out of there. That's what the counterculture was. Get out of there. Go find your own community. And what's more, make your own name. Use art to talk about who you are in this world. It's painful. No, they do not love you. They tolerate you. I feel like sometimes they don't really, they don't really talk to me. I said, you know what? They are obliged to have you upstairs. Show them something. This is where we're at right now. The show is one thing, but also independent living, all those things in the show. Then the, that's done, it goes very well, and now the last piece, back to Ambrose again. Let's leave real life and go to um, the world of art. And that was a wonderful, in a way, kind of a relief. Nick was able to let his neo-romantic uh, impulses out in the music. Um, we had a rich uh, text that was crafted in the mind of a great writer. Um, it was wonderful. And a whole new crop of uh, dancers are coming. Didn't happen soon enough, though. We built the piece, as you can see in that last piece. It's very intimate. All the actors, the dancers are required to read Seabold. And that was true. Somebody who shall not be named. <laughs> They were, they were told, they were said, okay, now I want you to read this, and then I gave them, take your smartphone. You know, I'm trying, I'm really hip too. So. <laughs> take your smartphone and go over and tell me the plot. Now this is a boondoggle of a plot, right? And now tell me what it meant. Oh, talk about separating the girls from the women, right? Some people had not read the book, but brilliantly explained <laughs> what the prop was, and went on about it, you know. It was kind of masterful in, in a way that they were able to do that. Now, I think subsequently they did read the book, but it was, tell, it was telling, and then they all had their own voice, their own piece of it. Now, we all shared a common starting point, not my mother-in-law, not my nephew, but this character in a work of art. And that was the last piece called Ambrose, which I, very, very proud of. Wow. <laughs> so, I have one more question. Maybe we'll open it up. A um, few things to, to pick up on. Uh, you ask, what is the dance about? I think in a Bill T. Jones piece, it's about many things, but it's about the dancing. It is about the dancing. And yes. you work with some badass dancers. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I, I preface this question with that because we have a lot of our students here. And, um, and this is the dance group. There are BFAs, raise your hand, yeah? 
MFAs, raise your hand, yeah? So nobody from the theater department? No, we have uh, a play downstairs, uh, Ma no, it's okay, 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 but this is, this is a, because this quite frankly, I, I am every year, I'm thinking the dance has got to be folded into another medium. Anybody here from literature? Performance studies. Performance studies. Mm -hmm. Good. Combination of literature. Yeah. So that's probably more of the wavelength I'm on right now. Mm -hmm. The language we use is a spoken is a is a movement yeah. language. Please. And uh, one of the special things about our program is that you don't have to want to be a choreographer to come here, but you have to be interested in studying it. You get composition creative process, mm -hmm. improvisation that leads to, to, to choreography. And the philosophy is that you will make a more compelling, a more interesting, a more useful dancer to whatever choreography you end up working with. I remember reading uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin mm -hmm. many years ago. Which Did I require you to read it? You just yes. read it on your own? No, I, re I think we were required. Uh -huh. Yeah. I see. Um, so I, I want to ask about this uh, collaboration with the dancers because they are not required to sing and act. They are required to. They are. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I mean, every one a triple threat. Uh, well, yeah. And a triple threat is an illusion even on Broadway. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's shocking. Yeah. It's shocking. Yeah. Because every time the show I'm working on now at Moises Kaufman, there's this whole pecking order. Um, there is the... The, the, the producer, then there's a person who's writing the book, then there is the composer, then there is the director, then there's a choreographer. So um, when you audition, they say, okay, we want you to have the dancers as you want. You get the best dancers. However, we have to hear them sing. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Somebody you just loved as a dancer, and they cannot they, so, um, so it, it, you would think this is the commercial theater, but you know, most you people cannot do all three. So, anyways, we're, we're, yeah. We're, yeah. Well, you know, I teach first year comp. I love it. I, they teach me really, and it hasn't happened yet. But usually, a few weeks in, I'll get a student come up, arms generally full, saying, "I'm never going to choreograph dance in my life. Why do I have to take this class?" Mm. And I very patiently try to explain that the way work is made today, generally is that it is a collaboration and it's letting each other's lead letting each other lead and it's you saying take your iphone and record uh your well first of all read a text that you're not in the habit of reading and now tell me what it was about and now give me your appraisal of what the story meant yeah. at least to you uh, yeah. that that was yeah. a i haven't done that very many times some people i trust like you i trusted you with everything you know you were naturally a leader gifted as a dancer showman you could sing you could do all those things uh but a lot of people they they say i came here because i'm, I'm a dancer right yeah. so you're you're making so people you, if they understand the process of choreography you think they will be a better dancer. Yeah. yeah. Well, you talked about Martha Graham making your dance about incest. I yes. think every step and gesture and glance and look she choreographed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even Merce, I oh, think, with his Merce. computer, you know, I don't think it's so true anymore. You need a kind of fluency yeah. to survive in the world of contemporary dance, whether it's going deep into Gaga and understanding that language and, and participating mm -hmm. in that. Or, I think, being a member of your company and, and having that kind of collaboration where I think, I don't know if you'd agree, but I think it's less and less looked at as a dance company and more as a performance ensemble. No, I, took, I took dance out of it. Yeah. It's Bill T. Jones, Arnie Zane Company. And it's New York Live Arts. New York Live Arts, right. Yeah. We are the resident company at, at New York Live Arts. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's true. I, now, I love uh, dance, but I don't think like I used to always in dance movement. Right. And what's more, I'm not even quite, maybe it's part of it is um, the self-involvement of a, a personality like myself. A lot of it came, radiated out from what my body felt, desired, and knew. And, uh, and you saw that Arnie and I, we found a way to work together. But Arnie very early said, you know, I don't live to dance. Yeah. You know, he did not. Arnie was already thinking, I make art. And I make art in any way I want to. And that was very important because I thought that the, the holiest thing was the sweat from the studio. 
that made, that was the only honest thing I could say truly existed in the world. And do I feel that now? Now I think it's about, you say that the, the generation, one thing about our era right now, it, people can, you can choose to work almost any way you want now, right? Is it in fashion? Will you get the funding? Will you get booked? Will you find people who will who want to uh, follow you on your process? Um, I mean, I'm thinking, if I had to spend the money, I imagine you guys are throwing down here. Uh, by the time I leave school, you know, I'd be looking for a job. And I come from an era where, you know, it was 25 cents to ride the subway. You know, you didn't pay people for rehearsals. You were always paid for rehearsals, yeah. right, were you? Yeah. But that was a big deal, you know. Twilight Tharp had thrown that down, you know? And a lot of people still were thinking, you know, if, if it had to do with money and art, already something was wrong with it, mm -hmm. you know? Now, can we ever go back to a time where you don't have to pay your rent and you don't have to feed yourself? And I guess you could all become massage therapists or get a degree and go teach dance somewhere at a university in the Midwest. I mean, I'm, I'm being a little, a yeah. little caustic here, but what else, what else do you do with this, these degrees you're getting? What are you going to do? Find the genius choreographer of your, around you and give yourself to them? Become a genius choreographer? What, what do you do? I don't know. I'm asking truly. I don't know. What in the hell do you think you're doing? <laughs> I'm supposed to be here to say dance is a noble, um, non-materialistic expression in a craven, materialistic world. You are fierce gods and goddesses, your priests of the true meaning of life. <laughs> well, life has a meaning, we give it. Let's move on. Yes. I have a selfish question. Yeah. We worked together for a long time, a long time ago. We both changed so much. Mm -hmm. but one thing I want to ask you, do you still think that the work can help save you? Do you still believe in sweaty epiphanies? Oh, the work can help save me? Yes, the work can save me. There is a transformation, there's a change, mm -hmm. because you made... But I don't think, uh, sweaty epiphany was, uh, uh, can be a trap. Yeah. Because if, if you get known for giving people their, their climax, mm -hmm. that's a trap. Because sometimes life is not about a climax. That was about D-man success. Yeah. And everybody, even today, they still want D-man, yeah. D-man, D-man. And what if you don't want to do that? This piece does not end with a sweaty epiphany. No. It does not. Um, and you're asking something very personal. Like, I've been, uh, Bjorn, my, my husband, has been with his mother, Dora, the very Dora, who, has a, who is literally dying a very slow and painful transformation. And he's there with her. So I get a lot of time here alone. And if we're not rehearsing, last week we were rehearsing, this week we're not. It's enough time to really go into the scariest place in the world, which is here. Um, and is, I'm not the type that makes notes. If I'm not in the studio with them, then who am I? You better have something else going on. It's a lot of escape that happens in reading and watching TV series and so on. Do I'm just dying to make the next work? You know, you pray that there will be an idea that hits you here and here that you have to pursue. We have a piece called The Deep Blue Sea. I'm thinking there is one. Well, uh, John, you're so positive. I've been blessed with this guy, right? <laughs> Deep Blue Sea, you could think of it as like holding on to something, right? Uh, it used to be a time that the rope, that the sky was full of these ropes, and you just like Tarzan swinging through. And then as the time goes on and you get older, there's one, there's one. If not, my depression, my self-doubt, all of those things, why does the world need another work for me? Those things will sink me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. even my own dancing, my body, I mean, I you know, get, I, I still do it, but it's harder to do. It's hard. That, that was shocking when that happened. I miss it. Yeah. Well, I can't imagine how I feel, you know. I used to think I could bust a move. It's like my mother Estella could open up and pray to God, I could bust a move no matter where. But you know what? It doesn't come, it's, that's one of the things about middle age. 
you got to cultivate that. And you have to look to others. You have to look to others, and you have to find a flame in them, and you have to fan it just enough, and then you got to be there with them. You know what people are building can't talk? <laughs> Good materials, the spark. Right? That's saving my life right now, mm -hmm. and my love for my companion. I don't want to fail him. Uh, he loved me, I think, because he saw me as on fire, burning. And sometimes, would he still love me if I was not? These are more than you about you saw I known for in this session, <laughs> didn't you? <laughs> but this is how I roll. This is well, how I roll. I hear you. We're going to hear from them. I'm, I was being a little selfish because my new dance, uh, and not to get into Grant speak, Grant speak, is a meditation on collective loneliness. <laughs> and I haven't put it out there. It's finished. I don't know if my nine dancers understand it or get it. Mm. I made a mistake of trying to explain it before we started and thought I, sh I should have been more like George Balanchine, who's <laughs> famous for not telling them a damn thing. Uh -huh. But I asked some big, <coughs> difficult personal questions, and I, I, I'm anxious to see if they That's get fair, answered. That's fair, Sean. That's fair. Yeah. Because, you know, I don't know how you feel, but I, one of the miracles of working with Janet Wong is Janet Wong is more scientific than I am. And she is an exquisite dancer, and she's very cultivated in a lot of different. She has dance balance, as you know, yeah. and yet she loves the work of Trisha Brown, and she can she can understand what's going on. She is now our curator at Miracle Live Arts. Uh, Janet is the one that is teaching. We I we talk about style. Maybe I, I thought that that's what we're doing. That's what connection do I have with this, this handsome young? Count to dance. I have the connection in the phrases that we make, the way we talk about space and time. And you know, uh, I say when I see you dancing, you remind me of, of people that I grew up with and the way so, so on. And I love, uh, first of all, really wonderfully trained dancers, but uh, the kind of incisive mind. Uh, not a, well, maybe a critic. I hope not a critic, but maybe a critic, but definitely somebody who's going to be thinking. Now. I thought that the style was the thing that connects us. The, five, the style is the thing that makes us, uh, I won't say family, I distrust that, makes us a community. And that is the way we do. That is, that can't, maybe that's the answer to your question, mm -hmm. the study of style. I had a very interesting talk, you read the Gia Coros piece, right? Yes. Yeah? And it was interesting because her, she and our conversation fell on this moment of, Style and technique. You know, style and technique. Um, I used to think that was the Bible. What is your style? Oh, I worked with uh, Graham, I was with uh, Ludovic, I was uh, Jose Limon, whatever. And now, what's my style? Uh, oh, I do Gaga. Isn't Gaga an anti style? You know, isn't God ever what happened after postmoderns had, uh, had, had severed the connection to the classical styles? And it's more experiential, right? It's not that you have to like train to do Gaga. I guess you can get accredited, right? But let's leave Gaga aside. I find it a, I find it a bit of an, an anomaly. Isn't Gaga authentic movement? You said about the being the first. Mm. Each generation has to be the first. What, what do you mean though? Authentic movement in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I'm, I'm confusing it with the conversation where I was talking to Trisha Brown, as you know, one of the probably the most original minds, um, right, rightfully so, she would be, in my mind, with Mercer was an original absolutely. mind and so on. But, um, and I said, look, um, our generation, Robert Longo, those people, we were the, the, the plunder generation. Remember Arnie and I used to say, mm -hmm. it is not... <coughs> it isn't so much about language, it's about syntax. Mm -hmm. You take this and you put that together and you make another sense of it. Um, Appropriation, I, hybrid. That's very kind of you, hybrid, yeah. I thought it was a little clumsier than that. I thought it was more like uh, uh, what Louise Nevelson did when she took a bowling ball and a bit of a cornice and something else and she put them in a box and sprayed them black. And uh, she said that uh, if you were cultivated in the third dimension, this was her way of speaking, you would know that that is no longer a bowling ball or a bit of cornice, whatever. It is now something else. 
So that's what Arnie and I were going for. We're big fans of her. So, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That, yeah. What, 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 what's on your mind? Stop, stop me before I kill again. <laughs> black boy joy. Are you giving joy to black boy? Or you are joy. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> Both work for me. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, I am a dancer, but I'm currently studying at the uh, Global Affairs Program and, and doing peace building. And so I've been reading a lot of articles about uh, the definitions of peace. And mm. um, there's a really interesting concept of negative and positive peace. Negative peace being just the absence of war. Mm -hmm. There's no war, but we're surviving. And um, positive peace being a space in which there is uh, more harmony and connectivity. Well, who, is, who is formulating this? <laughs> uh, the, this is um, Johan Gottling. He was a, mm -hmm. um, he's still alive and teaching. He's in his 80s, um, mm -hmm. but was a mathematician and a sociologist before he started doing this peace building right. work. And I was thinking um, the stories that you're drawing from for this work clearly have a lot of conflict, both external and internal. Yes. And I'm um, wondering if along the way you found any sense of the positive piece or if it stays, if they arrive at a negative piece or, or um, kind of what that mm. exploration might be or where they land. Well. Once again, you take the focus of the works and you put it more solidly on the narratives. And the narratives are, for me, part of another construction, part of something else. But this is fair. Dora says at the end of hers, and someone, his voice says, uh, were people different after the war? She said, people don't change. And when I first heard that, it like tore me up, you know? But then she went on, she's, Laura, Dora's 98 years old, and she was doing fine until last year. And she takes that, she's not a religious woman, she just does what she has to do. And one of her favorite things was, um, well, goodbye, enjoy what you can, you know, uh, enjoy what you can. And that's what I said to Bjorn today, who is struggling with this. So, so enjoy what you can, is that negative peace or is that positive peace, you know? Peace is the operative word, right? I, I'm not, I don't see the usefulness in the distinction, you know? If we have the absence of war, we have a chance of finding maybe what you call this positive peace, you know? We can feed the world, we can uh, find a way to renew our energy and not destroy the planet, we can uh, deal with the, the millennium-long inequities between genders and so on. I mean, <coughs> let's just have no war. People don't change, she says. And what she meant was, there'll be another war. And there was, and there is. Now, shouldn't artists be asking, how the hell do I live with that reality? That there always has been war, and there's a very good chance there always will be. Now, I want you to answer that one with your modern dance. Anybody else? Yeah, that's modern. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry? I'm Doja. Doja, hey, Doja. My question is, what is that lovely thing about dance? What is the what? What is the ugly truth about dance that you feel we need to know as home dancers, educators, and advisors? We have to work like hell so that dance does not stay a young person's dance. We have to work like hell so the dance does not stay a young person's endeavor. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful that it is a thing for the young. But you know, an old dancer is a pathetic thing. If they have not found a way to transmute it, that's the truth. Those knees, that back, that boundless energy, that whatever, self-involvement, that's what dance is made out of. Or is it? You know, we know about the special one. They had to pull Martha Graham off by literally a hook to get her off the stage, you know. You hear Paul Taylor talk about her at the end, you know. Uh, Merce, you know, arthritic, making dances, holding on to a bar. He just loved it. In the studio every day. And the dancers get younger and younger. That's not true. You get older and older. It's, old age is lonely in dancing. 
How are you doing with loneliness? You want to make peace about loneliness? Have you tasted it yet? Yeah? yeah this old, if, if this art form is lonely when you are old, now is that an ugly truth? Or an inconvenient one? Let's say eight months long. You know? Pardon? Mm. <laughs> well, do you want to speak to it, Kyle Moore? <laughs> no, I know you're not. I know. Yeah, that's a very good point, though. Very good point, unless we become cynical. What, what endeavor could one be involved in that does not become lonely as your friends die or lose themselves? Um, I, I, I've been saying this more times lately, late, Kurt, Kurt, Barn, Barn, Kurt Barnett, not Barnadu. Do you know uh, Fahrenheit 451? Yeah. He was lecturing a class of students. I think it, I don't know where it was, but he was saying one of the things he said in his um, commencement address was, "Be true to your oldest friends because they're the ones who will remember you when you were young." I didn't know what was he talking about. Uh huh. You know, yeah. gay story, being in a bar. In Samson, never, I don't think when we lived there, I was in Christian consciousness. We were not hanging out in bars, right? This is before your time, right? And here I am going back years later, Arnie has died, I'm in another relationship, and I'm being bad, I'm, I'm with another friend. He said, let's go to, I'm making it up, Elephant Walk or someplace. And I'm there, and you know, having a little drink, and there's somebody, a cutie over there, and hey, how you doing? Go on. Yeah. Oh, he's still looking at me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come back. I love your work, <laughs> Mr. Jones. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> Busted. Now, what did he say? You know, you're not, you're not a sex object for me, you old man. And what's more, you're famous. I just want to come over for that reason. But, you know, so. Now, why did I tell you that? You're going to think that's terrible. No, I can't tell you. That's why. Yes. I, the conversation linked to what my question was generating at the beginning. Um, as someone that ever trained with dance, I feel very cool and lonely now after becoming a single mother. Um, I wonder, like. You are a single mother? Yeah. You know, I feel old and lonely, I guess. I guess my question is, in the dance world, there is a lot of loneliness, especially when you're trying to navigate it, you know, mm -hmm. even when it's in that vibrant time of beginning and what you're discussing mm -hmm. and when the money or whatever comes, you know, or the, the work comes. When the work um, comes effortlessly. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Um, how, like, I would like to ask you as a kind of question to your answer to that question. Yeah. Is that how, how do you think that we can make those, because for me, one make of the way to make those connections between the older, what you talk about in the older age of, the older artists or dancers, if it is specific to dance, um, to bridge that gap? Mm. Well, I, first of all, I'm, I'm blessed to be surrounded by, I spend a lot of time with these guys, the younger people, and they're interesting people, and they're interested enough in what I'm doing. You know, I'm a, I'm a self-centered son of a bitch, so if they're interested in what I'm interested in, wow, I'm okay. Now, I know some of my friends, even older than I am, who, are, who say, well, you know, the secret to staying young is, 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 to, uh, is to be friends with young people. And, uh, yeah, good. Right. You know, I, I, I hesitate because uh, do we really have anything to talk about? I mean, what are our references? You know? I mean, that's part of this, this idea, you know? Um, age gracefully. Have a community of people that you, natural thing would be, all of you dudes in 30, 40 years would still be in touch. And you'd have grown together, you've had careers together, you've done all of that with children together, you know. But the art world, at least this is my experience now, 
there is more fraction than that. So, but I still think there's something about don't let um, uh, age be a barrier in making relationships. Now, this one, now you have to tell me, I don't know if there's some other folks here, nobody has to own up to being as old as I am, but you know, somebody said, I read an article that said that as we grow older, it's harder to make new friends. This is New York Times, so it's got to be true, right? <laughs> yeah. As we grow older, it's harder to make new friends. Have you found that? I agree. Yeah. Uh, of course, we're from a time where we lost so many friends. It's true. So had they not died of AIDS, they'd still be our friends. No, but I think my point is now the question is how do we build the gap, the bridge between the young? Yeah. And I'm saying surround yourself or become a part of what young people, of young people. Yeah. And I think even with people my own age, it's hard to have real friendship. You know? Yeah, I agree. There are fewer and fewer. But I will say that, um, and it's not just because I'm a graduate of this program, mm -hmm. Wendy Waring, Ted Marks, Lori Kill Martin, Emily Stern, mm. Elaine Wright, these are people that were in the piece that Bill T. Jones made in 1983 that yeah. I was in. We're still in touch. A few of them are in New York, mm -hmm. some are other places. But we have stayed in touch, and we go see each other's work. Um, That's why this man is a, a way a better model than I am. Because I've always felt your heart was pure in that way, and open and accepting and loving. Um, I think I was a seducer. I think that I was surrounded by, I had a fierce companion, who was very perfect. Uh, Arnie was the dragon, right? And sometimes I would be the damsel, right? You know, and uh, he was, wow, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do? We're going to take over the world, the dance company, a house. The, you know, he was doing that, right? And uh, I, there were a few people, Lois Welk, people like that, but there's a handful of them that I think I could call in the middle of the night. Um, and, I, and I don't blame anybody uh, but I, it's me, who, it's who I am. And it's very complicated. I think about it sometimes, race. It's one thing about that, the kind of groovy uh, 70s, 80s, when we were still hearing the counterculture of the 60s, you are not your body, you know? And you're not your body meant that your race didn't matter, your gender didn't matter, all those things. But guess what? They matter. Now, oh, maybe that's my pathology. So I think a lot of my relationships were, were transactional mm -hmm. about getting over, getting this to get that, you know? You're not gonna make that mistake, right? You're always sincere with everybody you need, right? And you don't expect to get, you wanna give, right? <laughs> I'm messing with you, but I'm messing with you desperately. Because you've got to show me that you know how not to make that mistake. You are sincere. You know how to do like this guy and make friendships that last. The only relationship that were most important to me, my company, was important, and my relationship with Arnie Zane, Arthur Aviles, Bjorn Amala. Where did I get that from? Estella and Gus, I guess. My parents, right? We're, you guys are taking this in a very, very interesting direction. It's good and it's scary as hell, actually. Conversation. Yes, sir. So, what's your name, sir? Uh, Brandon. Brandon? Mm -hmm. Nice to see you again. Yes. You yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, my question has to do with the phenomena of. Okay. Theater people tend to enter a room, and if they see another theater person, they'll see them and <laughs> hang and dry, jive and drive and all these things with theater because that's what theater does. But I've noticed that dancers don't always do the same thing. Dancers will enter a room and go into themselves and go into bar mode or go into knee mode or heal strongly from sits bones across the room. Hold on, hold on. you're saying even at a cocktail party. <laughs> what do you say? Enter, enter, enter the room. What, what do you? I thought we thought. I think we're in a social space. Maybe in so in a in rehearsal or in school, right? Okay. 
I'm not sure. Now conversation. you realize, of course, this conversation we've had is sort of we weighed it out into real world experience. Yeah. Real world relationships, friends, time, aging. Like you took it right back home to shop. Yes. Where we, and, you, and dancers do spend an unhealthy amount of time in dance <laughs> But that's what we love them for, you know. But no, but I'm not sure. In other words, I'm saying I'm not quite sure that I can critique. I know what it was like to take ballet class. I'm not a ballet dancer, never have been. We're all trying to be in Ernie Pagnato's class or Maggie Black or something. And what it meant when, you, when the center, the floor, happened. And you're out there, who's got the combination? Never mind that fucking Petty Allegro, right? You know, <laughs> yeah. And you know, who is talking about you over here and which group are you going in? Uh, that's, that, I thought, was always terrifying to me. I hated it. Uh, now, if that's what you're talking about, but you're saying literally in social space, the studio as a social space, the dancers have. Are you grinding acts with your colleagues? No, but I do want to understand any piece of advice that you might have to give this generation, your generation. Well, let's do this. Why don't I talk to you? I think mean, what you've said, you've got to take responsibility for that analysis, which was acted out and articulated. So it's something that is really important to you, and you have an axe to grind. And I think, uh, I'll say this respectfully, my brother. I find that one thing right now, I have a beautiful garden. And uh, when I, yeah, yesterday I was thinking, well, a couple of days ago, oh God, you know, it doesn't look as like it, it should this time of day, you know, like that. Today I walked out and thought, oh my God, this place is beautiful. What that says is that we have to defeat this thing, which is we can only look from the inside out through the glass, which is your state of mind, your expectations of the world. So once again, an age-old bit of advice, take responsibility for what you see and what you feel. So I would say everything you know about that situation, which sounds kind of terrifying, right down to heel toe, heel toe, you know, uh, are you a loving and fierce son of a bitch? Can you crack it? Can you go against what you expect the norm is in the room? And what happens if you don't? You're going to be not cool? Yeah, have you dealt with cool? We used to call it, in the 80s, we called it the cool disease. You know, we called it the cool disease. We got the cool disease. So everything you're saying, and I appreciate your honesty in saying it, but take responsibility for how the world is a sh has a lot of shit in it, right? However, you do not have to I mean, once again, I think this is a great example. This person is a great leader, right? Because um, I think I almost have a chemical problem with my uh, anger and moods. I accepted that as being, okay, that's what makes you an artist. That's how an artist can do the things they do, you know? But it's not so much fun as a human being. And I'm not going to buy it anymore. Are you able to love it? Let's talk about love. Who believes in it? Oh, ho, ho. You're going to dare look and see who didn't raise that hand, right? Yeah? Did they put all that hand is still up back there, the blonde man. And that, was a, that was a robust thing. Yes, I believe in love. Luca. Right? He's yeah. Italian. He's Italian? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course well, he believes in love. Genetically, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so you all believe in love. And as we used to say back in the days of R.D. Lang in the 60s, Love is a verb. How are you doing with loving? Loving in this era. Forgiveness, uh, you know, loneliness. Yeah. A piece I'm going after Deep Blue Sea is about forgiveness. You know, that shooting in Charleston? And then the fact that they all forgave Dylan Roof? I, I'm still trying to get my mind around. Staggering. It. Yeah, and, and I. That is the African-American prophetic tradition and this Christian tradition of turn the other cheek and forgive. I'm not that hard So when I ask you if you believe in love, because I think my understanding of love is imperfect. Is yours perfect? Perfect means, you know, you gotta like, you gotta pull a Mother Teresa. You gotta be, <laughs> you, you gotta do all that. So, love. Love. Now, 
Can I get an amen? Amen. No, you do not have to do that. Don't do that. You don't have to do that. Because the truth will be in the way you live. I, I, am, I am not happy. This room is horrible. These people are horrible. Take responsibility for you're in this room. You know? Yes, ma'am. I noticed just in the way that you speak that you honor women artists and thinkers. Um, Please. Even, even little things like separating girls from the women or just little play, mm -hmm. playful moves with words that shows that you can uplift women as heroines or mm -hmm. thinkers. Um, and I'm just curious, what do you think the role is of wonderful dudes in the world for uplifting <laughs> women leaders and thinkers? What do you think the world uh, is? Say, let me see. I think I got you, but you know who Frida Rosen was? I don't know if she sung enough but she was a very important therapist for a lot of us. David Dorfman, you know who David Dorfman? Uh, yeah, uh, she, uh, well, she used to be the... the uh, I have a colleague who told me just about her two weeks ago. Go right, on. well, Frida Rosen, one of the things she taught, she was fierce, you know, this uh, lesbian socialist yeah. woman, yeah. you know, and uh, she said, a progressive man will follow a woman. Mm -hmm. Boom. <laughs> you wanna, if someone, they say they're progressive, <laughs> A progressive man will follow a woman. I'm trying to be progressive. But you know, I noticed literally cocktail parties, you know, there's something about chemical that happened. Now, maybe I'm homosexual, but there's something chemical about a man's voice. Not that I want him, but there's something about the attention, right? And whereas you may, a woman might have to, I have to work harder usually because men are trying to talk over her. But I have to work harder to push them aside and look and talk to her. This is work. Never mind trans people. Trans people tell me we don't get it. People like myself, gay or straight, you don't get it how it's like to walk into a room and it feels like the whole thing is binary. And I hear that. You know, I got work to do. Pronouns and all. How dare you make me change my way of speaking? And this conversation is happening a lot in places you'd be shocked. Never mind, hashtag uh, me too. You know? How do you feel about James Levine? You know? I mean, he's a great artist. You know, all those, those petty people, they were bringing him down, and now he, you know, his music is not played on serious radio, and, and it's made it because he's conducted everybody, and if they don't uh, play James uh, if they don't play James and they're not playing uh, uh, Deborah Voigt, they're not playing Pasadena Domingo, they're not playing all of these people, and this is, this is robbery. We can't tolerate that. Well, yes we can. Yes we can. It's not fair! Well, the rest of the moment we're in right now, and we have to do it. How are you doing with that? It's not comfortable. I can't be spontaneous. Yeah, how are you doing with that? Is your generation we're putting it on the doorstep of? Well, actually, it was three years ago. You guys are you're you're in the wake of that generation, you know. Yes, sir. Um. I was fascinated by the way that you talked about form and content. I'm still working on that, sir. I'm not yeah. quite sure. <laughs> 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 but, uh, I, uh, I that's something that I struggle with all the time, aesthetically. And I was just wondering, you know, uh, literature is my my love, so mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by. Uh, I'm really looking forward to Saturday when mm -hmm. I see. You know, I read when I was a, a, a young man a line by Ezra Pound, which I misremembered for decades. Um, but but it's still what, what what he basically said was, poetry ceases to be poetry when it strays too far from music, and music ceases to be music when it strays too far from dance. He said the word always has to come back. Ezra Pound said that about yeah. dance. Well, he said it. I I, read, I went back. 30 years later, looked it up and mm. said it in different words, but that was, mm. was his intent. He brought everything back down to the body, at least at that point in, in his aesthetic. I'd be curious to know what he thought dance was, though. So. Mm. 
he, he, if I recall correctly, he, he, he brought it specifically down to the physical, mm -hmm. that it has to come back to the body. As the body is the site of all knowledge, he said that. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. The body is the site of all knowledge. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then this damn body betrays us. <laughs> that's, that's one of the things that I, uh, I'm becoming aware of now. There are many, many things that you're talking about that, that are way to resonate very, mm -hmm. very deeply with me. You know, but I'm wondering, with, with you, with form and, and content, you know, like I, in literature, there's a distinction between sound and sense, you know, when, when you're doing poetry. And aesthetically, I will always go towards sound at the expense of sense. Mm -hmm. if I had to make it Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, you know, if you had how narrative informs dance for you, how you mm -hmm. well, are going to continue on those things. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, see, I think I'm, I'm a crude literary person because I feel like the thing that um, literature has to do is just tell a good story. Tell a story that carries me along. That's how we, uh, since we were our Neolithic and Paleolithic ancestors, it was um, we understood the world by making a story. So we take, and that's why in dance, one of the big, well, in dance, I mean, Balanchine, the plotless ballet, and um, I, like, I miss Miss Graham, you know, of course she was, she had moved to such a point, as you know, Merce uh, Cunningham, I mean, John Cage supposedly famously said, uh, to Merce, you've got to get away from that woman. She's become too literary, right? So it said a lot about what uh, high modernism in dance was supposed to be about, right? No to the literary, no to narrative. Narrative is a, such a sweet thing right now. It's, it's overused, but we live in like a golden age of television writing where these narrative arcs can go over weeks and weeks and weeks. And we, are, we talk about people as if we know them, and we visit them in the stories they tell. And yet, you know what you're saying, the sound, the sound. I'm wondering if you, you're Italian, right, sir? Yes. You're Italian? Yes. Your English is very good? Yes. Are you coming to the performance? To be cured, he could never say, no, hell no, I'm not coming. <laughs> <laughs> he's actually, he's required. He's required. My point is, I wonder, a person who does not have easy access to language, there's a level of delight I find in the piece, in the way language plays. So I'm with you about sound. The way certain words, particularly in the Ambrose word, we have a lot of fun with uh, substituting words in the midst of the flow and so on. Uh, but I. I think that right now I'm in a kind of a place where in, first of all, I think that the audience, and this you probably could critique me, audiences now have an appetite more for narrative than they do for anything else, other than pictures. Supposedly, pictures now is the language of your generation. And I suppose that your minds are so well stocked that you make stories all the time from the pictures. And that it, uh, so I feel a bit like a dinosaur, you know? I, and I read poetry every day. My nephew, who I'm still involved in, educates a man who is looking at 50, but he has the uh, uh, educational level of maybe somebody in um, uh, junior high, maybe, generously. And he wants to read better, so we read poetry. And you read it through, and uh, I said, but now do you know what they're talking about? Yeah, but then oftentimes he doesn't really know what they're talking about. So you, poetry is this thing which is perverse. Now, now, why did she use, there's a poem a couple of days ago, a brilliant poem. She said, she said uh, um, she's comparing herself to a dog. Maybe the, maybe the piece is something like a bitch, something, something kind of shocking. And then she said, my two paws, Oh, Papa, my two paws, oh, Papa. And I said, did you see that? And he said, oh, well, yeah, she's talking about her hands. I said, no, but why did she say, uh, oh, she's talking about her father? And the poem took a turn with the word Papa. Paw, Papa. And the poem is really kind of devastating how she chases for years, like a little puppy, she chased married men. 
because she wanted the love of her dad, who was obviously withholding it. And this poem, so getting my nephew to just uh, stop, he was trying to get the sense of the poem. And I'm saying, now look at the language. Look, look at the language she's using. Now, at this point, that is, uh, we're at 101. And uh, that poem was maybe 2.2 2 or whatever. You know what I'm talking about. It's more advanced. If I want to make him read more, I can't push him toward those, those kind of, that seems esoteric. Pure sound seems esoteric. Poor, pure movement in some ways. Which is the esoteric one? Which is the one that is more for the specialist? Uh, pure dance, where people are moving around and making beautiful shapes in space and all, or dance is telling a story. If I'm going to take some, someone as a dance virgin and I want to have them go see something, do I go, what do I take them to see? Revelation! The music is full of heart. It's about the black experience. You know, oh, I got this. I got this. Uh, or do I take them to see Merce uh, Cunningham? I mean, Sense or whatever. I hate to put those two great artists, but you don't understand what I'm saying. You know? What would you say in actually what I'm getting at right now about if it's about educating people, bringing them into the arts, which one do you think is the best tool? I've always, uh, I'm a teacher, so you know, I, I always try and get my students to fall in love with literature and have a positive experience. You know, literature means storytelling. We see that that's the thing. That I, I find sometimes that when I start talking about formal formal elements in the literature, that that helps some of them. Ah, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's it's sort of going around the corner and hooking them that way. There are other ones that are hooked by the sword. And mm -hmm. the discussion of formal is just irrelevant. And, and mm -hmm. it almost seems as if they don't have, I wouldn't say the appetite, but even the taste buds for it. You know, I understand. And that's, so you guys have got to know how to do that, don't you? You, gotta, you don't want to dumb down the experience, but you also want to give people something that they can taste. Yeah. Right? Let us do something grand, just this one something small and important and un-American. Some fine thing will, remember, will resemble a human hand and not need a military band or an elegant forthcoming to tease spotlights or a hand from the public speaking, but be in a defiant land of its own, a real right thing. Frank O'Hara, to the poem. Now, that one, is it telling the story, but it has a voice, that it's a public voice. Let us do something grand, right? Which is already a story, isn't it? Yeah. Last question, Yasmin. Yasmin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm here presenting dance and technology. You're doing what now? Dance and technology. Ah. So, mm -hmm. so my thought, or my question is, um, how do you think Trauma and technology uh, subconsciously and consciously affects our lives. Jack, man. Wow. <laughs> I mean, good question, but my luck, you wait till the end to ask it. And I'm, I'm a stickler in terms. I mean, how does trauma affect the direction of civilization? How does technology affect the direction of civilization? And they always. Um, they had a relationship, you know, I, is it enough to say they affect it? I think you want something else in your question. I'd love to see the paper that's going to come out of this answer. You know, you know who uh, Annie Dorsey is? I'm very excited. I've just been introduced to her. Where she's a, a woman who, uh, because uh, Janet Wong and I are planning our next Humanities Festival, and it's going to be uh, about technology. Uh, the question of uh, who is the technology for, and one of those things is the people who have, who have invented a lot of the technology we have now, let's face it, are white men. Uh, we love them, right? You know, and they have promoted it, the, everybody from the uh, Microsoft, Bill Gates, yeah. right? You know, this happens a lot these days. 
Bill Gates, and then there's Mark Zuckerberg, and then there's Jeff Bezos and all. And the question is, if we're talking about the future, can those people be trusted to make the future for the underserved, the traumatized, the marginalized cultures? That's one question about the future in technology. You know, underserved, the poor people means traumatized? That's shorthand, and we tend to get kind of blunt at this point in conversation. Um, but this moment, uh, we were thinking, okay, one thing we should have in our Humanities Festival, which we do a lot of talking, show me some art made uh, with technology. So there's a lot of people working with algorithms right now. And a lot of it, Snorfest, you know. I mean, have you seen work, you know? We're gonna show you painting. So he puts a computer on a bunch of little things and they're like, and now they, we, through algorithms, they're making an abstract expression of canvas. Oh my God, when you see them hung up on the wall, bad, bad. However, she, and I, I would have recommended, I mean, I, I'm just getting educated myself. Um, there's a work I just saw of hers called <laughs> uh, Yesterday, Tomorrow. And it's just like it is, yesterday, all my troubles, in, and it ends with tomorrow, tomorrow. Now, how did they do it over an hour and 10 minutes? Algorithmically, there's three voices, and they're brilliant. They're sight reading. The machine is every night re-spinning each of their vocal lines. And it goes, and the machine has been told, and don't ask me how, to go from yesterday to tomorrow from Annie. And in the middle, you are in deep space. You are in, you realize this is really weird. What's going on? <laughs> What's really weird is because it's being made, it's a machine's sensibility, aesthetic. And you saw it happen. And there are human beings who are really doing it. Plus there's movement. It's all algorithmically being, and they have to, they're in a, 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 so they're sitting three couches, and I don't know, measure 50, whatever. Uh, everyone has to face right. But they're all like, they're like little like mugwups and what do you call those knitted things Mug you wear? Looks. Their legs cross, look to the left. But they're all doing it, these three people are doing it differently while all the music and sheet music goes around and they're singing amazing jumps and it gets stranger and stranger. And just when you think, oh, I should be right now running the exits because I've heard yesterday a lot of times, right? <laughs> you are really, something begins to affect you. Something begins to move you. And I think, oh my God, you are ready for a cyborg world. You're letting these machines manipulate your feelings like that? Letting the machines manipulate your feelings? Well, well this is, uh, you, I don't know about your trauma question, but I saw the future. And it was it dystopic? No, no, I'm sitting there and listening to sounds that are so strange. And I work with Martin Feldman, I work with John Cage. There's something about, and the, that was such an odd jump. A note went like this because the machine just made a choice and we followed. And the movement's being done in the same way. Very, very important work, I think. Very important. Her name is Dan Annie Dorson. And that's an older work, actually. And uh, she's working on a new one now, which I understand is even more algorithmic in terms of the choreography. So why would I want to give up? My, I'm, a, I'm a maker, you know? Why would I want to give that up to a machine? I don't know. This is going to be your question. Do you have room to share that space with uh, a thing? Yeah? So the last it's question. It's okay. All that mankind create. Oh. Excuse me. Although Oscar would say it differently, all that humankind creates that is useless is art. That's Oscar Wilde, the ever quotable Oscar Wilde. All that humankind creates that is useless is art. Now, um, just what happens that this piece is brilliantly conceived, brilliantly performed, and it swept me along. And at the end of it, I felt I had, like I say, I thought I had seen something. Am I, do I think those little robots on the floor or there's different variations of it? I saw a show in Paris where there's 
three cameras and there, there's a still life with a fox and a skull and whatever. And the camera has an arm, uh, the thing has an arm over here drawing and it has this one and it looks in the arm. And, it is, and you're sitting there and watching the machine, machine see. Um, no, I didn't think it was art, but I thought, so what? It was interesting, it was prophetic, it was disturbing. What, do, what, do we, what more do we want, you know? Remember the Andy Warhol? This is the question. When I was younger than you, I thought I knew it every, knew everything. I must have been a real turd, but the, um, we were taught in philosophy class. Okay, I get Andy Warhol's doing the soup can once, but why do you have to do, he did tomato, the famous one, tomato. Then he went and he did the whole uh, Campbell's soup line, <laughs> you know, split pea and so on. So people were saying, you know, when, the first one maybe was art, but after that, what was it? And his point was, already thinking ahead of us, this is in some ways the art of the future. It's about machine reproduction. And he said he wanted to make work like a machine. Did he say he wanted to be a machine? I think he, what was he doing? Is this like a perverse thing that a gay man says when he's angry as hell at the world? And he's been ugly, and you tell him, he says, well, fuck you, I'm gonna turn everything upside down. The Virgin Mary and Elizabeth Taylor are equal, right? They're both icons. What, what? Yes, well, but now do we, we accept it. It's all, they're all both worth millions of dollars, right? Oh, we could go on, okay. Thank you very much for a really wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you.